I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel. Today comes from John chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. Listen to the Word of God. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, Jesus said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, do you, do you believe me because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. There is a difference between hearing and listening. I imagine that any parent would have a story when their child heard the parent's words even though they didn't really listen to the wisdom the parent wanted to impart. It's not enough to let the sound waves enter the ear. It's necessary for the mind to take in what is being shared. For that matter, any parent would likely have a similar story for when they themselves were children. And they also failed at first to listen with understanding the words of direction and wisdom which came from their parents. In our first Samuel passage, we have a wonderful story with a back and forth about hearing and listening and not hearing. And it'd be funny were it not for the fact that it carried a message that was deadly serious. According to the passage, those were sad and troubling days. Because after years of God speaking to and through God's servants and priests, there had come a time when God's word was rare. Perhaps some thought that it was because God had decided not to talk to them. My sense instead was that when God spoke, no one listened. So for all intents and purposes, God's words were echoing unperceived, bouncing off ears unwilling to hear, unwilling to listen. Until, that is, little Samuel came to work in the temple. How much more of a caricature do we get from a, of a priest of God who was supposed to lead the people and be an inter intermediary of God's love and forgiveness than to have this person, Eli, a physically blind and spiritually deaf old man. Eli had closed his eyes and ears to the wrongdoing of his children who were doing things against God. And when God had spoken to Eli, Eli had refused to listen. And so no wonder the word of God was rare. And so little Samuel ended up getting an earful. That night when God called, Samuel thought it was Eli calling him. Samuel didn't know any better. He was just a good boy trying to be obedient and helpful. Eli, however, woken up in the middle of the night by this child, was annoyed and said, you're having a dream or something, just go back to bed. And it happened again. And it happened a third time. It's funny, right? Three times God is waking up poor little Samuel, knowing full well that it was Eli that was going to get woken up. So the third time is the charm, or so it seems to be. It was certainly enough of a pattern for Eli to have that sinking feeling. Wait. That may be God speaking. Why didn't I hear? Why didn't God just talk to me directly? 
And so Eli gives Samuel the phrase which would unlock the mystery. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I guarantee you that Eli did not sleep anymore that night. And after Samuel heard God's harsh prophecy against Eli and his family, I guarantee you Samuel did not sleep anymore that night. Both stayed in their respective beds waiting for sunrise, both knowing that God had spoken. Eli had to get it out of Samuel, the things that God had said to him, asking the young child to come up and give him a report of the vision. And when Eli heard it, he really did listen. And it was, even though it was a harsh judgment that God had declared against Eli and his children, Eli said, yep, that sounds like something God would say. In the gospel passage, we read Philip and Nathaniel are taking turns hearing and then really listening when Jesus spoke. When Jesus called Philip, Philip truly listened, immediately followed. So convinced was Philip that he told the good news to Nathaniel. We found the Messiah. But Nathaniel would have, would have none of it, disparaging Jesus as a country bumpkin from a worthless little town in Nazareth, or like Nazareth. If the impact of Nathaniel's harsh dismissal evades us, perhaps a contemporary despicable remark would give it context. Can anything really, can anything good come out of Haiti or Africa? Since Philip was convinced of who Jesus was, Philip challenged <coughs> Nathaniel, just come and see, or just come and listen. And it didn't take that much for Nathaniel to be convinced when he met Jesus. It's as if Nathaniel, upon hearing what Jesus was saying, had thought to himself, yeah, that sounds like something God would say. On the eve of the day when we remember and celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the words Dr. King wrote in a letter while sitting in a Birmingham jail point to a time when one could have said, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. As, as I was reading that famous letter Dr. King wrote in 1963, I looked up the letter to which Dr. King was responding and the background leading to both of those letters. The brutal condi conditions of segregation and racism against African Americans in Alabama was infamous throughout the United States. Fighting against appalling conditions, local African American clergy and leaders were working to change with nonviolent actions, which included sit ins and demonstrations. And as part of their efforts, an Alabama based group which was part of Dr. King's larger organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, called on Dr. King to come to Alabama to join in the campaign. And it was Dr. King was then arrested and jailed because of nonviolent demonstrations as part of that campaign in Birmingham. In an open letter, a group of eight prominent Alabama religious leaders, Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish, all of them white, denounced Dr. King's efforts, and they wrote, we are now confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of our Negro citizens, directed and led in part by outsiders. We recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow and being realized, but we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely. Dr. King's now famous letter, in response to that letter of the religious leaders, includes some memorable passages. Dr. King wrote, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. 
Never again can we afford to live in the narrow, provincial, outsider, agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider. You deplore the demonstrations that are presently taking place in Birmingham, but I am sorry that your statement did not express a similar concern for the conditions that brought the demonstrations into being. Justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for our God-given and constitutional rights. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and people are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I hope you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. In a time when the word of the Lord felt like it was rare, one hears Dr. King's words, and like Eli and Nathaniel, we might say, that sounds right. That sounds like something God would say. That may be something we can easily say now in retrospect, with the benefit of five decades of history and progress. The challenge as people of faith is to realize that today, God still asks us to listen and act. And so we ought to listen intently for God waking us up when we've become tone deaf to the corrosive racism and deriding of immigrants which happens around us today. Policies which intentionally make it harder for people to vote, especially if one happens to be black, especially if one happens to be poor, or both. Attitudes and policies which falsely scapegoat immigrants for crime and economic problems. We condemn racist remarks like what the president has said about people from Haiti and Africa as recently as this week. I could just as easily be describing the US in 1963 or in 2018 in some of these. Listen and act against prejudice. Listen intently for God already speaking through us when we are standing in solidarity with those who are being systematically oppressed when we fight harassment against transgender students in Bartholomew County schools, when we buy olive trees to be planted in Palestinian land in defiance of Israeli military policies to steal Palestinian land in occupied territory in the West Bank, listen and act against injustice. Samuel brought Eli the word of the Lord. Dr. King brought us the word of the Lord. Turns out the word of the Lord isn't rare, after all. Thanks be to God for God's word for us.